Welcome back to another episode of Strange Gaming Stories. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. If you're looking for new content, well, this is actually just a compilation of previous stories, so if you've seen these before, feel free to click on to the next video. But those who have never seen a Strange Gaming Story show, this is the place for you. What follows is a five-story compilation of some of the most weird, frightening, or just unexplained stories in gaming history. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. After over a decade of hiatus, the Mega Man Classic series resumed with the release of Mega Man 9 on September 22nd, 2008. The game was exactly what I needed at the time. One part awesome platforming, one part amazing music, and one part palpable nostalgia. It was a true return to form from the classic games on the NES, and in my opinion was one of the greatest Mega Man games ever created. There was just something about playing through a pixelated platforming masterpiece while everyone else seemed focused on the biggest and baddest new graphical monster of a title. And to top it off, the game was pretty difficult, if not one of the most difficult Mega Man games there is. To add to the already fun dose of gameplay that Mega Man 9 offered were the wide array of achievements like beating the game without dying, or even better, without getting hit. Shortly after the game's release, people began searching the various levels and menus for secrets. Ironically, some minor discoveries were made about potential secret weapons or character skins and were posted on Capcom Mega Man forums. To many people's surprise, former Capcom community manager Seth Killian revealed that there was a hidden secret in the game that nobody had found yet. Gamers began speculating that the secret was an unlockable character or a new level, but Capcom refuted all of these hypotheses. And as with any great mystery, the internet erupted into overnight detectives in hopes of discovering this Easter egg. But despite hours and hours of looking, there was absolutely no luck. Many posts, but no actual secrets of any kind. Seth elaborated on his claim saying, you'll have to look deeper than you've ever looked before. Well, what the heck did that mean? As gamers around the world wrapped up Mega Man 9's normal playthrough, DLC was announced for the title. The game was to feature an endless mode in which gamers could evaluate their platforming prowess by traversing endless randomized screens littered with enemies and perilous traps at each and every pixel. Based on Killian's earlier statements, many hypothesized that the super hidden secret had to be related to endless mode. To add fuel to this, Capcom confirmed this theory and gamers were back off to the races to look for clues. Needless to say, Mega Man fans tend to be some of the most diehard on the planet, so it didn't take long for them to power through as much of the DLC as possible, scouring each and every corner for signs of a secret. The gameplay in Endless Mode isn't necessarily entertaining, but it takes quite a bit of skill and determination to achieve significant progress. Playing through the DLC was fun at first, but to me, quickly became tasking the farther and farther I got became quickly obvious to me that if anyone was going to find this secret, it certainly wouldn't be me. And trust me, I've played hundreds of hours of Mega Man. The main problem with discovering this secret is that nobody had any idea what it was pertaining to, other than perhaps Endless Mode. Was this a bonus item, weapon, character, easter egg, glitch, or something different entirely? Statements from various Capcom members indicated that the secret would be discovered by making it far enough in Endless Mode. But how far was far enough? As the months ticked by, the Mega Man community went into a frenzy of pontification, doubt, and dedication to discovering the elusive secret. As the leaderboard record kept climbing, nothing of note surfaced regarding Mega Man 9's hidden secret. I remember in 2009, Seth elaborated a bit more on the secret, seeing as no one had even come close to finding it. In an interview, he stated, one, yes, the secret is real, two, you have to get to a certain screen in endless mode to see it, and three, it's not really that big of a deal. Wait just a moment. This seemed like a strange statement from Seth, because on one hand, it confirmed that the secret was real, and on the other, he ended up downplaying things because of the obsessiveness some Mega Man fans carried around dying to figure out this easter egg. 
Seeing the high score of over 7,000 screens pop up on the leaderboards raised his eyebrows even further, stating that the individual who got the score was over halfway there. There was also a brief posting of a 99,999 screen score later to be proven false through hacking. Seth initially stated that individual had more than likely found the screen, which gave gamers an even bigger clue. The secret was most likely only visible somewhere between 10,000 and 99,999 screens. No big deal, right? But herein lies the ultimate problem. Perhaps from looking on the outside, reaching 15,000 screens may not seem terribly daunting for an intense Mega Man fan willing to devote hours of their time to powering through the game, but that's where you would be wrong. See, not only do you have to focus on getting past each individual screen, but the game gets progressively more difficult as you go on. Let me explain. There are about 35 different screen combinations. Each area has a start and an end point, so after you reach an end point, the game just randomly puts you into another area. About every 30 second screen or so, there's a boss battle. After you beat the eight robot masters, your damaging rate goes up by one pixel. So, if we do some simple math, after screen 6800 or so, everything will kill you in one hit. That means in order to get to screen 15,000 legitimately, you would have to play 8,200 screens, including 212 Robot Master fights without getting hit. And I don't know about you, but there's very few games that I've played, Mega Man included, that I've managed to make it through without getting hit. And to do it through 8,200 screens and 212 bosses, it seems virtually impossible. But if there's anything I've learned over the years, it's never say never. In 2010, a video emerged captured from an emulator about what happens after screen 9999. I personally examined the video from start to finish, up, down, left, right, and everywhere in between, and for the life of me, I could not find one thing about it that stood out as an Easter egg. Although this weapon select screen does look a little bit funky. And let's not forget the game trailers dive into the secret where they use cheats to get up to 15,000 screens and yeah, absolutely nothing. Perhaps the secret only triggers without cheats, but who has that kind of time and dedication to be able to pull this off? As the game crossed the three year mark of its release, people all over the world began getting frustrated and skeptical at the elusive secret still out there for Mega Man 9. Some accused Killian of faking an Easter egg in order to keep the game relevant long after its release. Others who have spoken with him personally dispel this rumor, and honestly, it wouldn't make much sense for him to keep up the guys for as long as he has. Generally, the only people still playing Mega Man 9 already bought the game, so what does Capcom have to benefit from? Why keep the jig up for this long for nothing? There were too many questions left without answers. As the years went on, Mega Man fans began speculating on tons of different ideas. Is there a secret string of text on the screen? Do the enemies start behaving a certain way? Do the assets change at all? Does the game glitch out? Or do you have a kill screen like in Mega Man 10's endless attack where it just ends? Is the secret the friends you made along the way? Even data mining Mega Man 9 proved to be useless and afterwards many people gave up on the secret entirely. Perhaps Seth Killian started the conversation as an offhanded comment, and in a way to promote the DLC for the game, and no real secret exists at all. Maybe it's like the pendant from Dark Souls, in which the dev team admitted years later had no actual purpose, even though they alluded that it did for many years before that. Some even thought Seth would release some kind of hint after he left Capcom, but it appeared that the non-disclosure agreements were way too strong. Even in 2016, he remained adamant of his existence. The Mega Man's secret is something I pass on. I pass on to our community group at Capcom so they will carry the torch. I'm keeping it with me. People may discover it yet someday. We'll see if we can. Maybe we'll do a charity drive sometime and it'll be the least exciting secret reveal of all time. It's really not going to change anybody's life. It's a little thing, but I think secrets in the age of the internet are exciting. It is really real. If you don't believe me, you can ask the other community guys. Maybe you'll believe them. It is real. It's not going to set the world on fire, but it's a bit of fun. And I think having a little mystery in the world is a good thing. To this day, no one has confirmed nor denied the existence of Mega Man 9's hidden secret, 
other than Killian himself. What do you think? Is there a long lost Easter egg still out there? Was Seth Killian telling the truth? Or does this boil down to some clever marketing or playing along with the joke for way too long? Let me know what you think in the comments below. When you were growing up, did you have that kid on your block or maybe at your school who always had the latest game? You know, the one whose parents always seemed to buy games immediately after they came out. And of course, the other poor neighborhood kids like me would flock to his house in droves, foaming at the mouth for a chance to crowd around the television and see what new and amazing title they had. For me, let's just call that kid Jeff. This is a true story of how an obscure game cursed my friend. Jeff had it all. A nice house, a nice room, every console known to man in the 90s. Not only did he have the latest and greatest staple consoles, but also some consoles that most kids have no access to. The TurboGrafx, the Commodore Amiga, the 3DO, you name it, he had it. I have lots of fond memories of going over to Jeff's house back in the day, and there'd always be a new game to play. Many sleepovers were also had at his house for that same reason. It was truly a time to be alive in the 90s and 2000s. But with all of the good games Jeff had in his possession, there were certainly some that missed the mark completely. That brings us to today's story. Out of all the bad games I've ever played growing up, there was one that I had completely forgotten about until recently. This monstrosity is known as Top Banana, a phrase I've honestly never heard of before. It's a platformer produced by Hex and Psychor for the Acorn Archimedes in 1991, which was one of those PC-type consoles. The game was also eventually ported over to the Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga in 1992, which is a version that Jeff had owned. But this was a couple years after that, really close to the year 2000, if not after the year 2000 that we finally played it. The game's story, if you can call it that, is all about saving the environment, which doesn't necessarily have the best track record at producing games. To quote the game's synopsis from its own manual, our planet is under threat, not from slimy aliens or evil wizards, but from direct consequences of our own greed and stupidity. Every moment sees further demolition of the rainforest, more leaky nuclear waste, land floods caused by melting ice caps, and much needed food just rotting in locked storehouses. So your task is to combat these forces which are worlds into oblivion and you must address the balance through positive action. And it just so happens that you've got a super secret power of love. Yeah, I, I couldn't even make this stuff up. Honestly, when I was a kid, I had no idea what the plot even was, but based on how horrible this game affected me and my buddies, the plot doesn't matter. What about Top Banana is so haunting? Well, it all started the first time we ever played the game. See, the first obvious thing to note about Top Banana is the uncanny visuals. The background and the foreground all kind of blend together in a trippy, nauseating way. Based on some research I did into the title, it was actually part of the intent. Much like the lucid psychedelic feeling many music videos had years ago, Top Banana's developer actually used images from television and movies and plastered them into the foreground. They wanted to capture that same trippy feel and make something worthwhile and positive. But the result is anything but. One day, when me and the boys were at Jeff's house, he booted up this game his dad had brought home for the Commodore Amiga, a console that we barely ever knew existed or played. Given that none of the rest of us had that computer, we thought the game would be some super secret thing we were lucky to experience. Once Top Banana's title screen goes away, you're greeted with a highly disturbing array of images and are dropped into the world where KT must destroy the evil entities that promote pollution and all that other stuff I mentioned earlier. But right away, we all realized that this game was the farthest thing from fun. The graphics were horrendous, 
the way everything was mashed together on the screen made it extremely difficult to play. Not only that, but the enemies were pure nightmare fuel. The farther you make it into Top Banana, the weirder it gets. Your environment becomes more muddled, causing severe eye strain to the point where I remember not being able to physically look at the screen. On top of that were the incredibly strange bosses, including some dude's head with money flying around it and a weird robot. And the music was literally garbled, to the point where it sounded satanic. After watching Jeff play it for an hour or so, we turned the game off and switched to something else like Mario Kart. I remember we all thought it was a little bit off-putting and weird, but it even gave some of us the creeps. But perhaps no one was as affected by the game as Jeff was. You see, we all agreed to head back to his house the next day, which was a Saturday, but when I made it over there, I didn't see any cars in the driveway. Jeff wasn't home. A few days later, I had learned the truth. Jeff was in the hospital. He had suffered an intense seizure after playing video games the night after we left. It was serious enough that his parents decided to take him to the hospital, and the whole situation kind of spooked the rest of us when we found out. Seizures in video games are not terribly uncommon. I mean, in fact, some games have bold warning labels on the box, or even some text in the intro stating that flashing lights can be dangerous to somebody with epilepsy. But when Jeff finally made it out of the hospital, the first question on our minds was, what happened? And if you've made it this far into the video, you probably guessed it. It happened when playing Top Banana. At first we thought it was a fluke, because, you know, it was a Friday, we'd all been playing games for a long time already, and he kept playing video games after we left. But being the stupid kids we were back then, we just wanted to give the game another try. Except Jeff's parents gave him an explicit warning not to play Top Banana, which of course we didn't listen to. About a week later, when Jeff's parents were out, me and a few friends all headed over to his house on a Saturday, and we were full of questions about his trip to the hospital and exactly how he felt after playing the game. He seemed a bit off, but otherwise in good spirits. When we all asked if we could play Top Banana again, he said sure, but he didn't want to be in the room when we did. So, of course, he handed us the game and told us to let him know when we were done. We ended up starting the game all over again, and it was just as bad as the first time we had played it. Horrible instances of eye strain and haunting sound effects and music. It was like a car accident. You couldn't look away. The game was just so bad. Except something happened this time that changed things between Jeff and us forever. After playing the game and cracking stupid jokes for a half hour or so, Jeff stormed into the living room where we all were and turned off the Amiga. I remember him yelling like, you all need to go home now or something like that. We all kind of laughed it off at first, but seeing the look on his face, it looked pretty serious. Maybe it was because he realized how upset his parents would be if they found out what we were doing, but looking back, I don't think that was the case. I think he was generally disturbed by the game. None of us ever played Top Banana again. In fact, I didn't even realize what the game was called until a couple of weeks ago when I was perusing the internet. Jeff kind of faded from the friend group entirely after that. We would still occasionally go over and play games with him, but he never seemed as into it as he was before that day. Eventually, he stopped having us over altogether, and we just grew apart. Being much older now, this game gives off such an odd feeling in my mind. Its legacy is forever tarnished, not only because of how bad it is, but how it haunted our friend Jeff back in the day. I haven't spoken to Jeff or really even thought about him much in over 20 years, and for all I can gather, his social media presence is non-existent. I've never heard of him ever having another seizure, but Tom Banana seems to have affected him so much that it literally changed his outlook on video games. I just hope that wherever he is and whatever he's doing, that he's alright. To my knowledge, a video game has never caused anyone to go blind or be killed from visuals or something crazy like that, but I'm sure it's landed multiple people in the hospital. The developers of Top Banana sought to create something unique and psychedelic, but had no idea what other effects the visuals could cause. To those looking to play the game, I'm sure there are workable ROMs out there, but I honestly don't recommend it. Mother 3 has tons of unused content, all of which has been meticulously extracted through exploring the game's code. 
If you're familiar with the series at all, you may have seen articles over the years pointing to how the final battle was supposed to be way darker, but Itoi wanted to focus more on the friendship and love aspect of the game instead of the darker tone that Earthbound took. Well, by digging into Mother 3's code, there are more than a few tidbits that link to this. There are a plethora of cutscenes, sprites, and even a series of unused bosses that all support Itoi's wish for a darker ending. The unused boss and backgrounds of Mother 3 heavily incurred some massive amounts of speculation and theory ever since they surfaced on the internet. Although no one is entirely sure who first discovered these secrets, they can be found by doing a bit of digging into the game's code. In order to battle the unused battle backgrounds, in the cheat code menu of emulators such as Visual Boy Advance, 020047EC must be entered into the address bar, and one of its enemy modifier codes must be entered into the value bar. The codes must be put in with 8-bit size and the number format on hexadecimal. You know, for those nerds out there that actually know what that means. There are 13 different enemy modifier combinations, ranging from the strange to the downright terrifying. After entering in this data, you have to encounter an enemy and trigger a battle, and you will see the following. Deemed by fans as Lucas's nightmare, these disturbing images make almost no sense on the surface. There is no doubt that some of these images are unnerving, but the mystery for their existence makes it all the more interesting. Let's break it down piece by piece. The first thing that I noticed was the obscurely random name assignments that all of the enemies seem to have. Dung Beetle, a silver angel looking thing, Tent Person, a yellow form, Snow Bunny, Clay Man, Sign, Vapor, Rope Snake, Aeolia's Table, Straw, Mini Elevator, Train, and by far the creepiest of the bunch, Vapor 2. None of these names seem to make any sense whatsoever. You know, I, I thought about the names over and over again, tried to work in the first letter of each enemy name, I tried to look for patterns in the names. But I couldn't seem to come up with anything of substance that fit any kind of pattern. In the game's code, all 13 of the unused battles don't have any sort of name associated with them, so it makes the names even stranger to me. Even further debugging into the game's code by sites like the Cunning Room Floor and the Mother 3 fan translation sites yielded no new data on behalf of these enemy names, realistically leaving me to believe that they are nothing more than placeholders. So now that we got the names out of the way, what is with the disturbing imagery that accompanies the enemies? The first few start off creepy, but innocent enough. There are wavering images of Klaus and a masked figure, but the further we go, some of the enemies like Aeolia's Table and Vapor 2 are pure nightmare fuel. It begs the question, what were these battles supposed to be used for, and why? Why are they so creepy? So what's the deal? Why the random assortment of battle attributes, names, backgrounds, etc. I think if it was supposed to be found, many of the bosses would be exactly identical, but each of these seems to be almost entirely unique. But for what reason could they all possibly exist? 
Well, as for pretty much anything in the Mother franchise, there are a few theories floating around about them. The first theory is that these enemy sequences were meant to play during a chapter of the game when Lucas experiences some sort of dream sequence. Perhaps this theory was further propagated by the title of the unused battles given by fans. Perhaps Lucas really did have slightly clairvoyant nightmares about he and his brother Klaus becoming more and more intense as Klaus's body was literally being torn apart and rebuilt for him. Maybe their PSI abilities were reaching out to each other through their dreams, helping Lucas understand the pain that his brother was going through as his humanity was being ripped from him. This reminds me a bit of the strange force-driven connection that Rey and Kylo Ren share in the newer Star Wars movies. They're able to sense and experience some of the feelings the other is encountering, sometimes even to the point where they seem that like they're in the same room as each other. Overall, this theory is intriguing, but I don't feel like Itoi was trying to make Lucas and Klaus's relationship one of purely psychic foundations. I, I just don't buy that. Vapor 2's background and accompanying music help it stand out from the rest. Many theory-driven fans liken the background to the final fight with Gygus and Earthbound. Did Gygus really have a hand in the events of Mother 3? Did Ness and his friends fail to quell the maddening beast and put the genie back in the bottle? As cool of a theory as I would like this to be, and I talk about it a bit in my Gygus Theory video, you can click up above and watch that, Chikasato Itoi pretty much deconfirmed it in an interview with Nintendo Dream, stating, Mother 3 was always planned to be just brother versus brother, and the options they considered were betraying the player, keeping the battle and ending vague and having no dialogue, and other options that Itoi describes as ones that would make you really wonder about the main characters when looking in from the outside. In addition to that, it's very impossible for Gygus to return in Mother 3 due to the fact that he was fatally wounded by human emotions from the events in Earthbound, in which he probably damaged his time-traveling technique. Honestly, I thought it would be cool if Gygus interrupted the final battle between Lucas and Klaus, inhabiting the latter's body and causing all these crazy forms and just this crazy psychedelic experience, but it looks like we got the details set straight from the master himself. There's absolutely no connection between Mother 3 and Gygus, with the lone exception being the existence of Porky Minch. Another thought is that these unused boss battles were originally intended to be part of a dream sequence, kind of like I said earlier, but in a different turn. In this case, we're talking much like Ness's nightmare in Earthbound, when he goes through Magic Hand. Lucas, in this case, would be thrown into a dream state, in which he has to face his past and inner demons in order to make it out of his nightmare alive. This would have also mesh pretty well with the unused cutscenes that were uncovered showing multiple flashbacks with Lucas and Klaus with their parents. Coincidentally, I think this sequence would fit well into the story during chapter 2 when Lucas has trouble sleeping over his looming grief from letting Klaus go. He even hallucinates a bit, adding to the potential that these unused boss sprites could have been part of a hallucinatic dream. Granted, this goes a bit above and beyond even the theory that I'm coming up with here, but uh, you know, it is a theory. Was Lucas so incredibly distraught that he envisioned the degradation of Klaus's soul in a moment of clairvoyance? Possibly. It might seem like a stretch, but I think it's a possibility. Now, let's get to our last theory, and to me, this is the one that holds the most weight. I remember hearing in an interview with Itoi where he mentioned the fact that he was going to go for kind of an effect in Mother 3's final battle. He wanted it to be dark, much more intense than that of even the final battle with Gygus and Earthbound. However, even though the second title in the series squeaked by with a K to A rating, which, I mean, I'm, I'm honestly still puzzled by it, like, did they even play the game? Video game ratings were starting to become more and more strict, and I doubt we could have seen anything as ominous as Itoi was planning and still kept the game rated E for everyone. Nintendo being the family-friendly company they are, more than likely shot this idea down and the final battle was changed into what we remember it as today. 
After all, as I did mention before, Itoi referenced the fact that he wanted the final battle to focus on friendship and love more than the dark tones, and I think there's something that tells me there's more to the story than that. If this really is the case, why leave in the various unused content in the game's code? I've seen tons of hidden things uncovered in video games as planned easter eggs, as well as those items that were obviously left by mistake. What's weird about Mother 3's unused content as a whole is that it falls somewhere in the middle of these. It's not a blatant easter egg, but one that you could kind of argue Itoi requested that it would be left behind and, you know, the rabbit hole opens up, so to speak. It could really keep people's mental cogs spinning for anyone who found it in the future. Well, I mean, if that's the case, I'd say it worked pretty darn well considering I've now written an entire video about it. Sugisato Itoi is truly a man of mystery. Alright, so, uh, this is just to, um, prove to you that I'm not lying about this game that I found. I'm just gonna walk you through everything that I've seen so far. And, uh, obviously it'll be exactly as I described it, because this is it. On March 12, 2017, a video was uploaded to a YouTube channel entitled Pets Cop. At first glance, Pets Cop appeared to be an interesting and obscure game from the PS1 era being played on this channel for the very first time. Developed by an unknown company, Garalina, in 1997, the game played like a pretty bare bones title where you have a brightly colored world and you're going around gathering pets, giving them a relatively safe place to stay in your possession. Your Let's Play navigator, Paul, leads us through the gift plane as he uncovers ways to catch these various pets for himself. After watching this particular segment in what was supposed to be the first section of the game, it becomes apparent that Pets Cop is not your average game. Like, what even is this as a main character? It's entirely too creepy. The game feels too difficult, too contrived. Like it wasn't originally intended to be a game, but merely an avenue or something more. Except, Paul quickly identifies there's more to Pets Cop than meets the eye, and that specific instructions he has written on a piece of paper can help to unlock a hidden world beneath the gift plane that hides some more than sinister secrets. Down, 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 right. Start. Alright. So you can see that it accepted it and the music stopped. I'm just gonna go out this way here. So, uh, it appears to be the same, except when I actually leave here, it'll be a little bit different. All right. By entering a specific controller input combination, Paul was transported to a dark and empty world known later as the New Maker Plane. This was a place meant to be found by someone specific and houses an incredible array of secrets. Cryptic texts, unknown characters, they all litter this underground avenue, and Paul works to learn his place amongst all the twists and turns. As Paul continues through the New Maker Plane, he uncovers a slew of mysteries. Some kid named Michael died prematurely. Someone named Marvin haunts the plane and even attempts to ask Paul for help, making the game appear almost sentient in nature. A girl named Care has been kidnapped, and some girl in a windmill disappeared a long time ago. All of this is meshed together with ominous underground landscapes and haunting music playing as Paul navigates this world. 
it makes everything feel so incredibly uneasy. Throughout the next several months, internet detectives came out of the woodwork in an attempt to solve Petscop's many secrets. Was this a real game? Was this some sort of an elaborate ARG that we're just left a breadcrumb trail of? With each episode's subsequent release, things only seemed to get more confusing. But of course, that didn't stop Redditors and YouTubers from compiling as much information as they could extrapolate from Petscop's various episodes. YouTubers like Pyrocynical and The Game Theorist created hour-long dissertations on Petscop episode analyses, and the Reddit team started creating a document chronicling theories and explanations for the web series Loose Ends. And yeah, it's, uh, it's got over 100 pages now. Petscop quickly gained popularity throughout the internet with its slow episode release and massive speculation. Something about it almost felt like a found footage type of series. Something that was more than meets the eye and convoluted enough to keep people guessing video after video. Just as theories were beginning to materialize, a new slew of videos would release that completely blew everything else out of the water. Although it became a common consensus that Petscop was fake, it didn't seem to reduce the hype of it at all. Never had a creepypasta been done so incredibly well before. Petscop had taken the world by storm, but even by the end of the web series, many were still left dumbfounded on what it was even supposed to be about. Over my initial impressions of Petscop several years ago, all the way up to my most recent revisit of the series, and the numerous theory videos floating around out there, I've formulated something I hope to be clear and concise. Which, if you've seen Petscop personally, you know is anything but what it normally offers. In the beginning of the series, we are introduced to the series' main protagonist, Paul. Paul's family received this copy of Petscop and appear to be using Paul's intelligence and gaming prowess to uncover the secrets that the game possesses. Paul becomes consumed by Petscop in the process, trying to figure out what his place in all this is, as the lines between his life and the life of Care, the girl who was kidnapped, start to blur. From what we can gather throughout Petscop's 24 episodes, Marvin's friend Lena Leskowitz disappeared sometime in 1977 when they were visiting a windmill. However, during the series, we learn Marvin may actually know more about this disappearance than he lets on about. Regardless of this fact, the disappearance of his friend sparked some sort of insanity in Marvin, leading him to track children down and kidnap them in an attempt to rebirth them into presumably Lena. He even goes as far as to kidnap his own daughter, care and leave her in the basement of his school for five months in an attempt to rebirth her as well. When she finally escapes and returns home for her birthday, she is not the same girl anymore, hence the persona Care and LM or Nobody Loves Me. And how exactly did Petscop become the vessel for uncovering these secrets? Well, that all points back to Michael, the boy who died when he was eight years old. Michael's brother Rainer was close to Marvin and his family and knows Marvin was involved with Mike's death in some sort of fashion. He's using Petscop as a way to communicate the information he has uncovered in hopes that someone will connect the dots. Rainer originally started this project for Marvin, and judging by the various clips uncovered by Paul later in the series, was also played by various other children throughout the years as well. Rainer, having been disturbed enough by his discoveries, gives Petscop to Paul's family finally kills himself, completing a rather macabre form of poetry. Mike was a gift, and now Petscop becomes a gift to Paul's family. Although originally passed off to him as an interesting Let's Play Easter egg hunt, Paul's family eventually takes control of the Petscop YouTube channel and effectively forces him to play it religiously. His only avenue of escape is through the likes of Belle, another child Marvin attempted to rebirth but had failed in the past. How he knows Bell, I have no idea, but just, just bear with me here. Through Petscop, Paul shares his discoveries with her and eventually thwarts Marvin's rebirthing plans forever. As I mentioned earlier, the world lines between Paul and Kara's lives become a bit blurred at times. He says he does not know her, although multiple times throughout the game there are lines of dialogue shared by Kara that Paul believes he said himself. Is Care actually Paul after she came back from being locked in the school basement? Are Care and Paul related? Are they the same person in different parallel dimensions? 
simply using Petscop as a way to interact and communicate? Although no confirmed answer ever surfaced, I like the parallel universe theory the best. Although this plot synopsis is not complete, it does help to shape the overall themes that Petscop possesses. After the entirety of the web series was released, a man by the name of Tony Dominico announced via Twitter that he was in fact the creator of the project. Unfortunately for the many fans of Petscop, he didn't tie up all the loose ends, confirming some fears that the project had become bigger than the creator intended. Dominico confirmed that Petscop was not exactly a game, but the entirety of it ran from a Petscop.exe file saved on his desktop. He had heavy inspiration from rebirthing projects, abuse cases, and one of his favorite film directors of all time, David Lynch. In a 2020 interview with the site EGM, he said, Inland Empire is probably the largest single influence, that being a David Lynch film. You know, this whole thing of being trapped in a cursed film, you can make certain connections. In Inland Empire, it's kind of like a found footage shot movie with bits and pieces being pieced together of a girl that ends up taking on the role in real life of the character she portrays in a film. It's an underrated movie, but also helps explain a lot of the links he had from an inspiration perspective. One of the most important themes undoubtedly had to be associated with rebirthing. The Newmaker plane was named after Candace Newmaker, a young girl who famously died during a 70-minute attachment therapy session used to rebirth her and help her attach better to her adoptive mother. You're not sure. I gave up. How about I gave up? See, this is your life. Yes. This is your life. Where are your eyes supposed to be? Yes. This is your life. That. I don't want to do it, Neil. Good. Say that again. I don't want to do it, Neil. I hate doing them. I hate doing them. Again. I hate doing them. Again. I hate doing them. Louder. I hate doing them. Again. Unfortunately, due to the unnecessary intensity of this treatment, where Candace effectively was suffocated while she pleaded for her life, she passed away. During the fatal session, Candace was asked if she wanted to be reborn, in which she responded, eventually, no. This prompted the unlicensed doctor to shout, Quitter! 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 Another nod from the quitter's room in Petscop. See, the rebirthing process will only work if the subject in question wants to be reborn, and in Candace and Bell's case, they did not. Dominico admitted later that the references that he made to this tragic incident were in bad taste. He said, A decision like that, to reference a tragedy involving real people, should have had a lot of weight to it. It should have been something I treated very carefully, Dominico said. I did not treat it carefully enough. But also, I feel that this series was just not the place for that kind of thing. Throughout parts of Petscop, Rainer also mentioned to Paul that he could close the loop, which effectively forces someone into a rebirth, suppressing their emotions. This is honestly a twisted take on the whole thing, and one that Paul ultimately ignored. Throughout the 24 episodes, Petscop touches on depression, family trauma, suicide, and more, but nothing that really jumps out at you in the slightest. This was another one of Dominico's goals in creating Petscop, in this and some of the other projects he's made over the years, he always wanted to convey a very subtle horror. A horror that had to be discovered by being thrown in your face. He felt that not many video games contained this type of horror, and ultimately it was something he yearned for and strived for within Petscop. Every October, I'm like, here's that mood again, and I kind of get excited about it. Then I remember that the majority is cheese or pure misery or torture or gore or all of the above. That is not my thing. The whole vibe repels me and makes me feel kind of sick. Dominico's method of creating horror is one of my personal favorites because you always feel like there's something more to uncover. The room for interpretation is endless. Every tiny facet, regardless of how small, helps add to the unnerving feeling I get when watching it. The music from the school is incredibly ominous and creepy, with the booming notes reminding you of how you probably shouldn't be there in the first place. The liminality of the new maker plane in its many rooms, the sentient addition of Marvin, Bell, and the Tool, the countless references to the rebirthing project, and the amazing narration by Paul. I mean, honestly, 
Nothing about his voiceover ever really feels scripted. He went from curious to frustrated, then obsessed to courageous. It was an Oscar-worthy performance. Unfortunately, with as ambiguous as Petscop is, there are more loose ends than completed ones. Why did Rayner use a video game to do his detective work instead of going straight to the police? Did he create AI for Marvin and Bell, or are they really playing the game in kind of a multiplayer format? How does Paul know what buttons to press to speak to Marvin, or how to play the needles? Lastly, what are all the things that are censored? Is there any purpose to this other than to make us more curious? I mean, I guess we'll never know. The more you dig into it, the more confusing things get. But some of these plot holes work in Petscop's favor, because it adds to the realization that the elements within this universe become very matter-of-fact. It's like, oh, of course Paul was able to solve an extremely obscure puzzle by moving around a bucket or moving around on the map a specific way. It helps build the horror up even more. Perhaps the biggest mystery surrounding Petscop is why? Why would Dominico choose this as his avenue for storytelling, yet leave so many loose ends out there for people to pick apart? In many ways, this reminds me of that big influence he had in David Lynch. Many of his films weave a story in a very unorganized manner where the viewer must piece them together in order to get the bigger picture. In essence, the journey for arriving at the plot and purpose becomes more important than the plot itself. There are tons of random, speculative tidbits here and there that people get stuck on, but perhaps they really don't mean anything at all. And that, to me, is the biggest problem with Pets Cop. I think it would have either been better as a completed story, or one whose author was never revealed. Tony Dominico's unmasking himself as the story's creator puts an unrewarding conclusion in motion. We may start to wonder why about specific unanswered questions, but with Pets Cop being over, there really isn't any incentive to continue pondering. It honestly kind of sucks. To add to this is the uncomfortable nature in which Dominico responds to Pets Cop's criticism. He stated countless times that the viewer's endless sense of speculation and theorizing over his creation made him feel uneasy. Other than answering mostly basic questions about the web series, he hasn't really done anything or doesn't seem intent on closing the many loops Pets Cop contains. He has gone on record saying that he had more to talk about within the videos itself, but was not conclusive on whether he'd ever make any additional videos. And now, most recently, he has confirmed that his work on the series is complete. It truly does appear that the mysteries surrounding Petscop will never be solved, only to fade into the depths of obscurity over time. It's true though, even if Petscop's creator didn't feel the need to extend the story, that didn't stop the community from doing what they do best. In fact, shortly after Petscop was fully released, a fan project called Giftscop was created in the web series Wake that emulated the original wonderfully. Best yet, it allows the player to take an active role into Petscop's deepest mysteries. And to top it off, it is wonderfully done. I've seen a couple of videos on the game, but I haven't played it myself. It's truly a testament to the game's profound impact on the community. Donkey Kong 3 was released in arcades all over Japan in 1983. Capitalizing off the success of its predecessors, the third installment changed things up quite a bit, introducing Stanley, a bug spraying exterminator with a knack for repelling giant apes. The goal of Donkey Kong 3 is to spray bugs trying to attack you and your plants and focusing on the big monkey in the middle as well. It was a cool enough concept and gained enough popularity that Nintendo ported it over to the Famicom in 1984. To this day, many still regard it as a hidden gem on the console and one that many people forget even exists entirely based on being overshadowed by the originals. But Nintendo wasn't the only one that wanted a piece of the Donkey Kong pie on the Famicom. Developer Hudson Soft was granted rights to port several 
of Nintendo's early games over to Japanese PCs, such as the Sharp X1, PC6601, and PC88. You may have even heard of a unique port called Super Mario Bros. Special, which plays similar to the original Super Mario Bros, but is changed up significantly in the gameplay department. And the graphics are very recognizable. Unique enough, a port of Donkey Kong 3 was also planned for several of the Japanese PCs. The game was released in 1984, though not much if any details are available for it on the internet. Entitled Donkey Kong 3 Great Counter-Strike, it had some large differences from the original, but the games were incredibly elusive. Some people even speculated that the game didn't exist at all. And all the talks about these elusive ports were nothing more than vaporware. Fast forward to just a few years ago, and an actual copy of Donkey Kong 3 for the Sharp X1 had gone up for auction. The individual who won was nice enough to dump the ROM so others would be able to boot it up and find out just how interesting of a game it was. In these PC ports, Donkey Kong 3 plays much different than its predecessor. Rather than being a straight port, the gameplay has changed up to resemble more of a top-down shooter like Galaga. But the one thing right off the bat that stood out to many people playing the game was the odd and unnerving mix of background screens that would appear depending on what level the individual was on. But on the surface, none of these backgrounds seem to make any sense whatsoever. Granted, there's not some sort of a huge story involved in Donkey Kong 3, but they seem incredibly out of place. Why? Why do these background images exist in the game? What is their purpose, other than coming across as entirely too creepy? Well, I had a few of my own theories, and I did some investigating. The first thing I thought about when looking at the various images is that they all appear to represent some sort of real life picture. This is furthered by a Twitter page I found that automatically produces other Sharp X1 images by just simply adding a real photo into the generator. I actually made the thumbnail for this video off of one of those images they posted. Perhaps these are all just some sort of mishmash of random images that somebody in Japan thought was cool. Maybe, maybe not. If this is the case, why are they all so incredibly weird? Someone posted in the Creepy Gaming subreddit about the potential for these to be song lyrics. I decided to plug all of the messages into a randomizer and then plug those into Google. The result? Uh, well, okay, so I realized that there are so many combinations of these put into a certain order that it would actually be kind of impossible for me to do that, but I did do it enough times that I realize there's no way to figure this out. Uh, yeah, absolutely nothing. Other than one or two of the phrases matching up from time to time, little to nothing of substance was ever found with this method. Then I started looking through each of the images and phrases again, especially in the order that they are played in throughout the game. It kind of starts to take a very basic supernatural story. The first couple of stages all represent some sort of travel. On the highway, on the strange bridge, and on the country road. All of a sudden, aliens that look like they're from Among Us appear and they're headed towards Stanley and Donkey Kong, leading them to being abducted by a UFO and leaving the Earth. Throughout their journey in space, they encounter an asteroid belt, the planet Saturn, and eventually another unknown planet where they presumably leave the spaceship. From there, they continue to battle the aliens and end up falling into a volcano that explodes with a mushroom cloud, and it sends them back onto the planet they started on. All right, so this might seem like some sort of a stretch, but I kind of had a lot of fun theorizing with it. The weirdest fact about all of this is how nothing appears to have anything to do with Donkey Kong 3. If you've played the Famicom version, it's a very different game. But even with the changes from the Japanese PC ports, no similarity seems to exist between the gameplay and the images. Am I thinking much too far into this? Probably. But that's kind of the point, right? As much as my curiosity pains me, I didn't stop there. By going to the Mario Wiki page, I saw that the game was programmed by Fumihiko Itagagi, who is somebody I'd never heard of before, but he actually hasn't done a lot since this game came out. But his last credit was for Mario Party Star Rush back in 2016, which meant he may actually still be working in the industry. Interestingly enough, 
In some locations, it actually mentions that he wrote the game. So if anyone knew why these super strange backgrounds existed, it would have to be him. So I used a little bit of my Google foo in hopes of locating a contact email for Itagagi. And wouldn't you know, I got a match. I was eventually redirected to an email prompt and off I went with a good feeling. Here's what I wrote. Hello, I'm a video game content creator who makes videos about interesting gaming discoveries across the internet. I became fascinated by your work on Donkey Kong 3 PC ports and wanted to get some more information about the backgrounds to the stages and how you use them. Do they have any significance? Why were they so much different from the actual game? How were they created? Thank you for your time and the work that you do. Best, Kevin. I also had a link to my YouTube channel and sent this message in English as well in Japanese. Then I waited and I waited and I waited. This was about three months ago. Still nothing. And I was out of leads. <laughs> Just like that, we were back at a dead end road. So my question still lingers. Why do these backgrounds exist? Why are they so uncanny? They're familiar yet strange enough that it gives us a vibe that we shouldn't be seeing these images. Why are they involved in a Donkey Kong game? Ironically enough, the day that I posted this video, Itagaki actually responded to me. Great timing, right? I wasn't able to put this into the original video, so consider this an addendum response. He said, Hello, Kevin. The background you're referring to is exactly the background image of the game screen, right? At those days, PCs had slow drawing speed and, of course, no sprite function. So some kind of technique was needed to move the object at a sufficient speed while composing the background and the object. That work was also a test of one of those techniques. The resolution of the background was reduced by half, and the number of colors available was very limited. I converted many photos to images and chose some images from them that look good even with the resolution and the number of colors. So the scenery I chose has no meaning in itself. Is this a good answer for you? Best regards, Itagaki. Well, it seems that we didn't quite get the ominous or unexplained answer that we wanted, but at least we have some closure now. I hope you enjoyed this dive into five more strange gaming stories. Be sure to let me know what you thought of some of them in the comments below. Be sure to send me an email or DM on Twitter if you have better ideas for future gaming stories. I love researching these strange tales of gaming history. As always, this has been Press Start to Continue, and I'll see you next time.